Hello everyone and welcome to this new online live conversation of L'Ecole, the School of Jewry Arts. My name is Gislain Ocreman, I'm a Jewry historian and the conference project manager for the school and I'm very happy to see you again for this new program, Back to School of this new year of talks that will take place, as you may know, every month and look around, I'm on Place Vendôme in Paris on a very sunny day, that's summer again, we can say, and today we're going in a special place. In this location, we're going to talk about the secret language of flowers. Before we start, just a few words about the program for those that don't know us or maybe that are coming back with us. We will have a talk every month, one different topic each month, and we'll be delighted to help you having more information on the Jewry world thanks to everything related to gemology, craftsmanship, Jewry history for sure, each time with specific elements. Here I'm on Place Vendôme for a specific reason. The school is over there. The school has been created in 2012 with the aim of spreading out the Jewry culture to the world. Whether you are in Paris or anywhere in the world, we try to reach you online or on-site if you have the ability to come to Paris to really help you to understand and discover the jewellery in our eyes. And there is a special exhibition for this September. Van Cleef and Arpels decided to organise an exhibition related to the world of flowers and this is precisely here. Place Vendôme has been created long ago by the late 17th century because the Sun King wanted a new square for Paris. This square has been transformed with Napoleon I with the column which is right behind me in the early 19th century. But we have to wait for the late, late 19th century to have the great jewelers settling on Place Vendôme. At this very time, in the mid-1890s, the Ritz Hotel on my left side has been created and all the great clients of the world came there to see the beautiful jewels of Paris. So it is we say normal that we have a beautiful exhibition about high jewelry on Place Vendôme. It's called Florae. It's about flowers. And we're going inside this place called the Hotel des Freux. And we're going to reach my colleague and friend Paul Paradis to know more about the exhibition. Shall we go? Good morning, everyone. All of our friends from Asia and all over the world. I'm Paul Parody. I'm a teacher and art historian at L'Ecole, School of Jewelry Arts. Many of you have seen us before. Welcome back. We're privileged today to be within the confine, this beautiful exhibition organized by the Maison Van Cleef and Arpels with very unusually un multifaceted artist, Mika Ninagawa. Mika Ninagawa is known in Japan and all over Asia. She started as a fashion photographer. She's done music videos. She's done movies. She has actually a series now on Netflix. But her love is flowers. She says, I could never not be a photographer. And she loves to capture the ephemeral beauty of flowers. This exhibition shows us almost over a hundred pieces from the Van Cleef and Arpels heritage, patrimoine, museum collection, contemporary pieces with flowers. And these pieces are brought to life with these beautiful photographs of Mika Ninagawa. The, the actual, uh, the sort of mise-en-scene, if you will, of this exhibition is by Tsuyoshi Tane, a young Japanese architect who's very up and coming. He's won many awards for the Tokyo Olympic Stadium and other great projects. His idea was to have a labyrinth, take us into a labyrinth where we get lost in mirrors and we're immersed into this beautiful world of flowers. It's his first collaboration for a jewelry project. Mika is an old friend of the Maison. She, she was, uh, did a project with uh, Van Cleef and Arpels in 2017. And without further ado, we'd actually, for those of you who are far away, we know you might not be able to make it for the exhibition, we're going to show you a virtual visit, which will give me time to go meet Gislain, and we can start our talk. So enjoy your visit, and I'll see you in maybe two minutes.
And now we are back to the entrance of the exhibition. We're surrounded by the pictures of Mika Ninagawa, all with beautiful colors. And we are very happy to see you again to talk about the secret language of flowers. Hi, Paul. Hello, Gislain. It's good to see you again. It's you good too. to be back. This is the new, uh, the new start for the program of talks that we have. Um, for those of you that don't know uh, everything, just a few housekeeping, if I may. Um, we will not be alone for this talk. Uh, on the chat, online, we have Anzita Gay Eckel, our dear friend and colleague, uh, professor at L'Ecole, dual historian also, who will be there to answer your questions and also collect all the key questions to give us the question at the very ending because our talk will last about an hour, but we'll keep the Q&A for the very end. So no worries, we'll be there to answer your question as far as we can. And uh, if you missed the very beginning, or if you want to see us again, uh, no worries, we have a YouTube channel of the school of L'Ecole, and all the talks are recorded and put online over there to so have access to all the program of the talks that we have uh, created. So we hope uh, you might know it yet, but if not, you might rediscover it uh, very soon. So let's start immediately this topic of the secret language of flowers, and we're going to understand uh, since when we have this idea of a language of flowers. We have, we actually wanted, we thought about why, why do people use flowers to pass messages? We can't even find the beginnings of the use of flowers and plants for symbolism because we don't know. But we can imagine that nature has always inspired humanity. But we do know that as time went on, we're going to talk about antiquity, kings and queens. We're going to take you through the roaring 20s. But for this uh, portion, we wanted to just introduce this idea of floriography. It becomes virtually a science, if you will, a sort of um, romantic science. And you have important works uh, during the Victorian period and even before. In France, you had a lady called Charlotte de la Tour. She wrote a book called Le Langage des Fleurs. And this book was in 1819. And in this book, she tells you which flower means which feeling or which sentiment. So yes, it's a dictionary. Is it scientific? Not so much, but it, it had such an impact in other works, similar works, that actually the publishing industry in that period was basically revived. So many people were buying these dictionaries of the meanings of flowers. And in Victorian England, people would use these books to decide which bouquet to give to a loved one because you couldn't express openly certain sentiments in those societies. So I'm just giving you one example in the 19th century and we're going to talk about many other periods, but it's the period when floriography, the language of flowers, exploded onto the scene. And we wanted to show you this beautiful print by Musha, who of course is the Art Nouveau artist, who became famous by working for the great actress, Sarah Bernhardt, when he did a poster for her in 1894. She said, I love you, I want you by my side. And he became the talk of the town, if you will, during what we'll call Art Nouveau. We'll talk about it later. But if you look, this actual, this actual print is called Le Langage des Fleurs, the language of flowers. And he produced it for a, um, a manufacturer of beautiful fabrics. And he shows us, you can see this lady, she's surrounded by lilies, a typical of Musha when, with the, cur the curves and the counter curves and all of these lilies and this lady who's lost in her thoughts with her flowers. And you can also see this, um, as Musha was Moravian, you can see sometimes his, his actual fabrics have a very Byzantine feel. This mixture was very popular at the time, and he became sort of the chouchou, as we say in French, of the Art Nouveau movement. And we thought this was a very poetic way to start our talk into the language of flowers. Absolutely. I love the word floriography, I know. which definitely is, like a, is a sort of, yeah, more scientific and poetic word to qualify this idea of understanding the flowers. Of course, the language of flowers is vast. We can spend hours and hours. So with Paul, we decided to pick up a selection of flowers for sure and to divide them in three categories which we're going to discover in the three chapters of the talk. Chapter one, legendary plants. We're going to go back in time to the ancient civilizations, even to the early Middle Ages, to understand millennia years ago how the flowers were highly symbolic in religious, political, um, cultural means. On the second chapter, we're going to move on to Asia. I'm sure at the moment we have lots of Asian public with us. So we hope you will appreciate and, and connect because we try to make 
this um, east meets meet west uh, uh, connection in between the way flowers were used uh, on this other part of the world from which we are and how sometimes the West try to reinterpret this sort of, uh, of illustration of flowers. And last but not least, we wanted to make for the last chapter a sort of contemporary look. So is there a contemporary mythology? Is there a way to talk about the flowers today? And is there a secret language behind it? That will be the last but not least chapter. So off we go immediately. Let's start with our first moment, legendary plants. And we wanted to start with the, the cradle of civilizations. We're going to what is called today Iraq. This is ancient Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is one of the oldest civilizations of the world. Uh, historically, it's a civilization that, of course, developed high agriculture, great cities, and of course, writing. So from the writing, we have information, cultural, religious, social information on how life was there and how the meaning of some symbols can be analyzed. What we know, if you look at this illustration, is that the first type of flower, shall we say plant instead, um, is not a precisely, I mean, botanically speaking, a precise flower. It is a symbolic flower, which was traditionally called by the archaeologist the tree of life. What is that? If you look at the relief, which is from the Louvre Museum in Paris, the great museum over there, this relief was a more than human size architectural decoration for the palace of Sargon II, a new Assyrian emperor. So we are in the first millennium BC to be exact. It's the late 8th century BC. So it's a really long time ago. This sort of human figure is not a mortal. This is a genie. It's a it's sort of a little god in a way. It has this tiara with the horns uh, that proves his divinity. He's got beautiful jewels. As you see, there's not only the beard, there's a beautiful pendant on the ear. There are some arms uh, of wrist bracelets with little flowers, as you can see. And he holds, on the other hand, sort of a plant falling down. But what attracts us immediately is this sort of architectural tree, very symmetric. Symmetrical in the structure, it's very organized and structured, and we don't know exactly what this is. Some people, some of the researchers, some of the specialists will fight because there are three hypotheses, three suggestions on what it is precisely. Is it, option one, a date palm tree? Because dates were very important at the time, and we know palm trees were frequent in these regions. That's the first possibility. Option two, it can be not a real tree, but a sort of biblical version of the tree. From the Genesis in the Bible, you would have this idea of the tree of life. So this idea of the primordial tree. Option three, it may not be a tree. It could be a sort of mini architecture, a construction for the worship, for the cult within a temple. So you see, there are Three options, totally diverse, totally opposite at some point, and all the experts would agree on not being agree on what exactly is this piece. What is interesting is that the tree of life is everywhere in the ancient Mesopotamia iconography. From the third millennium, I said third millennium before Common Era, to the late centuries before common era, you really have this object. And here, this is more a Persian object, so it's more or less modern Iran. What is interesting in here, we are in the late, late first millennium um, BCE. What is remarkable is that on this mini object, it is not a huge architecture like the former relief. It's a few centimeters high. It's a cylinder seal. A seal normally is in the shape of a button. We know this for, with the ring shape, so we just press on the wax so you can mark your identity with the seal. Here, you don't push it, you roll it. It's a cylinder. With a cylinder, you would roll an iconography, which is the symbol of a god or something um, divine protecting you. It, it's part of your identity. It's like your ID card in a way. And you can see easily 
that it is the same symmetrical organization of the plant, it is the so-called tree of life, if I can say so. And what is remarkable here is that it is a jewel in itself. It is made out of carnelian, which was really considered as a very important gemstones for Mesopotamia, for these civilizations, in Egypt also. We're going to see it after. And what is nice is that, you may know, the cylinder was pierced. So you can put a thread in it and wear it as a bracelet or as a necklace, as a pendant. It's something you will keep with you. And that sort of object really proves the importance right under the sun of the tree of life as a protective symbol, as a symbol of life in a large way. The sun which is there has wings. It's a Persian symbol. And we know how the Persian spelled garden in Old Persian. They said paradeisa which gives the word paradise. So a paradise is the word of full of garden. There are plants, it's like an oasis in the desert or in the mountain. It's something giving you life in a large way. It's sort of biblical reference afterwards with the Garden of Eden, right? But it's interesting to see that this symbolic proves plants, trees, flowers are highly symbolic since the old days. So from Mesopotamia, let's move on to Egypt. Yes, indeed. When we think of flowers and we think of amulets and we think of meanings, we often think of ancient Egypt. And today we decided to, to use papyrus. Papyrus, we all know paper, the word paper comes from papyrus. It's a plant that can grow up to five meters high all along the Nile Delta in Lower Egypt. Mm -hmm. It's the symbol of Lower Egypt, uh, the papyrus. The Egyptians used it for many things. They used it obviously for paper, they used it to make little fishing boats, they used it to make amulets, and they also used it for food ever since the pre-dynastic period all the way through the Roman period, can you imagine? So papyrus has a highly rich symbolism and we wanted to talk a little bit about mythology because the papyrus of course is the plant that represents life, it represents a regeneration. And in this amulet you can see in the middle, which is at the Met, it's just a small little column about this size, made out of their version of faience. The color, the name of it, waj, actually means green, regeneration. And these amulets, as you probably all know, are found by hundreds within the tombs of pharaohs. They're woven within the bands of their, their mummies and they're helped to help you to go to the next life. That's what it's all about, isn't it? There's also the very famous myth of the papyrus with Osiris and Isis, the first pharaoh and queen of Egypt. The evil brother of, of uh, Osiris, he kills uh, him. Seth kills Osiris. And Isis is afraid and she takes their son, Horus, and they hide within, under this umbrella of beautiful papyrus. Papyrus in Egyptian mythology represents light, it represents dark, it represents evil, it represents good. It's this whole, the foundations, if you will, of, of Pharaonic Egypt. So for Egyptians, this, we, can't even over, we cannot overstate the importance of papyrus. And we chose a couple of, of, of jewels, which are actually 20th, 20th century and 21st, on the left is La Cloche Freya, this, symbol, this beautiful um, dynasty, this family of jewelers, which you all learned about when we had the exhibition at L'Ecole and the beautiful book by Laurence Maifarine. But we wanted to show you in the roaring 20s, Egypt was all the rage. Remember that 1922, they discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun, Lord Carnarvon, <coughs> Carter. So it was an infusion into the decorative arts. And this beautiful uh, bracelet, if you can look at the detail, it's typical of that period, a bracelet that moves. The ladies, they moved, they had short hair, they were dancing, they had uh, arms uh, that were not covered with fabric. And this bandeau bracelet is light, it's with platinum. And you can see it's set with diamonds, with mother of pearl, tourmaline, you have our, and we have our famous uh, flower here, our papyrus flower, or leaf, if you will, with sapphires and tourmalines. And you have turquoise, you even have a black pearl. And here's our eye of Horus, the son who saves and, and regains the honor of his father. So just to say that this Egyptian theme became the scarab, of course, regeneration. It became sort of the lifeblood in the decorative arts, didn't it, in the 20s. 
And the other piece we selected is contemporary. It's Cartier from 2017. It's a high jewelry uh, watch with 32 Zambian emeralds, which were selected for their matching color. Now, these emeralds were cut specifically to create this beautiful fan, this fan shape of the papyrus leaf. And if you notice the workmanship, the beautiful um, uh, lapidary and diamantaire work, these triangular diamonds in between these uh, beautiful Zambian emeralds set with prongs. And of course, we're all thinking when we see the onyx and the shape, it does remind us of Art Deco and of that Egyptian period, which is so important to all of the jewelry houses on the, Maison, on the Place Vendôme and uh, Cartier and their archives as well. So two pieces, uh, different periods, all from the same inspiration of ancient Egypt papyrus. So you see from a long time ago, civilizations really considered plants in the high level of meanings. And we're going to move on to Greece. Ancient Greece had this idea of the sports game. Like, well, we had the Olympic Games a few months ago uh, in Japan. What is interesting is to see the importance of it in the world as a symbol of sport. And of course, to give the victory to someone when the someone was victorious, an athlete, you will crown him with a crown wreath of branches. Normally it would be laurel. Laurel was the flower attributed to God Apollo. Apollo in ancient Greece had an episode in the mythology saying he fell in love with a young mortal woman called Daphne. And the young Daphne was not in love with him. She was running, running away and he was running after her. What is interesting is that um, she prayed a river god on the side to transform her in something to be protected. And she became a tree. Daphne in Greek means laurel, so she became a laurel tree. Apollo caught the tree, took a few branches and created the wreath uh, with natural plants and said, thus I am victorious. So since that time it became a symbol of victory. What is fantastic is that if you look at the iconography, you really see how the athletes would receive after the games this crown, this wreath of laurel. This is something very old that you can even see today in any sort of awards in a large way. What is lovely too is to notice they did exist in gold. Gold was hammered, was chased, was really worked in a way to illustrate nature perfectly. And here, this is a gold laurel wreath that dates back to about 300, 100 BCE. So it's a long time ago. We are in the ages after Alexander the Great. And what is fantastic is how they depict all the details of the laurel. It was very important to be naturalistic in this illustration because the type of flowers that was represented, the type of leaves, uh, would be connected to a certain god. Laurel is for Apollo. But if you change the flowers from this, you would have oak leaves. It would become Zeus. The oak is the biggest tree, so the, the oak leaves would be symbolic of the king of the gods, Zeus in person. If you would have vine leaves with the grape, it would be completely different. And you will have god Dion Dionysus, the god of wine. And this is highly symbolic to see that every single plant has its own meaning. Speaking of Dionysus, we're going to talk about him in Roman times, right? Yes, we, we, we wanted to talk about the idea of grapes. Okay, it's not a flower, but it's a fruit and it's a plant. And we, we know that it's highly symbolic. Of course, it represents abundance. Of course, it has religious connotations. The grapevine, which grows, which is the word of God in Christianity. And on the left, we, ch we chose two uh, examples, both from different parts of the Roman Empire. On the left are, are, is this still life of grapes. And it, it's from a town in the northeast of Tunisia. It was a Carthaginian town, which became part of the Roman Empire under uh, Septim Severus. And this is a way for rich, wealthy people with their beautiful homes to show what the people were going to eat. So it's actually a mosaic of grapes, which were quite, um, let's say, um, rich, were very, uh, let's say, a luxury. Wealthy for the elite. Yeah. In the triclinium, which is the dining room. And so these beautiful zenyas are still lives. You can find these mosaics. This one is, is in Tunisia in the Bardo Museum. It was a way of showing the guests what they were going to eat and also a way of showing, uh, giving them an uh, appetite for the beautiful and rich things that they were going to discover. And later in the Eastern Roman Empire, later in, Byzant in Byzantium, the, the artists around Constantinople, they became extremely, let's say, um, 
talented in gold work. Yes, they inherited some of the, the techniques from the Western Roman Empire, mm -hmm. but they also made a lot of innovations. And on the right is this bracelet, which is the, the way that the bracelet is made, it's actually typical of a Byzantine form. You have the medallion in the middle, and you have a pin on the side, which you'll pull out, and the, the bracelet, sometimes they have a hinge on the back. This one doesn't appear to, and the, the lady could put it on her wrist. This work is extremely refined. You have this little granulation around the edges, typical of this Byzantine uh, beautiful goldsmithing, and the grapes, which are just carved out of triangles of gold and all joined together with this thick wire. Uh, gold wire. Now, gold uh, was extremely coveted in the Byzantine Empire, and in fact, it was a period of great uh, wealth, and there were rules about gold. Uh, a free man was allowed to wear a gold ring uh, the, with the Justinian Code in the 6th century, but precious stones were reserved for the emperor, and jewelry had a highly symbolic, uh, it showed your rank, it showed which family you became, and whether you were important, whether you were from a different class, mm -hmm. and it was a political significance. And we can't really decide, uh, the jury is still out, whether these grapes are representing Christianity. It's completely possible because we know since the fourth century, Christianity became the religion of the Roman Empire. But it doesn't, it, in, in this case, it might just be a beautiful motif showing the wealth of the lady who was wearing it. Out of these um, highly civilized cultures with Greek and Roman, they were what they called barbarian. Barbarian was the the name of those that didn't speak Greek or Latin for them. But they were not uncivilized at all. On the contrary, there were great civilizations like the Celtic in particular for the northern part of Europe. And what is very important is that with the researches, the excavations done by archaeologists, we had more information on some of the plants. And one of them, probably the most important for the Druids, for the priest. A Druid was a priest, a leader, a sort of medicine man for the Celtic you would have the mistletoe. The mistletoe is, is something that the druid would collect on a certain time of the year. After fall, the sixth day after the new moon, the, the leaves would have fallen down from the trees so they could easily recuperate the mistletoe. <clears throat> the druids would get there, cut the mistletoe and use them to prepare a medicine, potions, some would say, to create something for the cult. We have to know that the mistletoe was related to Taranos, which was the god of the sun for the Celtic. So you really have this sort of interpretation um, of bringing the sun, bringing the, the power of light in these days after fall, which will lead to, to winter and which would be cold and darker days. When archaeologists in the late 1980s found in Globurg, Germany, this statue, they actually found a hill and they saw it was just a hill in the landscape. But eventually they realized it was a tumulus, so a gathering of tombs. And right out of the tombs, they have this isolated statue of someone who was probably a leader, a hero. Was that a mythological figure, an actual person who lived? We don't know. But it was some, someone very important, as you can see, with a beautiful outfit and this very weird, if I can say, Mickey Mouse ears. This is not the Disney character, not at all. This motif that you have at the top of this headdress is actually the shape of the leaves from the mistletoe. If you see them one close to the other, you would actually see this exactly reproducing the shape of it. So it's taking this plant as a divine power as a divine symbol to really show the high status, even the hero status of this person. But the mistletoe was quite abandoned from the iconography during the Middle Ages onwards. And what is interesting is that we have to wait for the late 19th century with the arrival step by step of the Art Nouveau movement. Without Nouveau, some of the, the plants that were considered uncommon, sometimes unappreciated, will be back to the um, reuse in the iconography. And uh, René Lalique, the great uh, jeweler and artist, was a designer at the beginning of his career, working for some jewelers. And here he worked for Vever, who was a maison on Rue de la Paix, next by Place Vendôme, so right a few, a couple of minutes from where we are. And uh, they decided together, Vever and Lalique working together, to recreate, give back a place of honor 
to the mistletoe here with these pearls and these diamonds and it proves how mistletoe was not considered badly afterwards. But that's a quite European point of view. I think in America you have yes. the mistletoe for At New Christmas Year, time, for Christmas. Okay. We, we actually kiss under the mistletoe. But that's romantic, <laughs> isn't it? That's poetic. It's all it's it's part of a druid, a Celtic druid sacrifice. True, yeah. <laughs> in France we kept the idea of mistletoe just poisoning the tree, but it could have a good, a good side, not just a dark side. So we wanted to talk about heraldry, this idea of since the Middle Ages, symbols that let people know which, what your family, what your affiliation is. It's a very important language and flowers were often used in heraldry, we call this. So we thought it was important to look at this type of symbolism and we chose two um, beautiful examples. On the left you have the Palatine crown, it's a masterpiece of Gothic, let's say late Gothic uh, uh, jewelry making, uh, goldsmithing. And it's very rare that it survives so long. In fact, it's, it belonged to a princess, an English princess, Blanche, whose father, Henry IV, arranged her marriage with a German prince, Louis III, because it was an important alliance at the time. And it came as her dowry. <coughs> And this crown traveled to Germany where it is now still conserved in, the, in a museum in Munich. But what's interesting to us here is this beautiful flowers. First of all, it, it has something like 90 pearls, uh, 30 uh, bala rubies, which are actually spinels. And it has fleur de lis. If you look at the detail on the top, it has 12 stems, each with a fleur de lis on the top, which are set with uh, three or four sapphires and a spinel in the center these clusters of pearls. There are 12 and they all, just for the, the practical side of the goldsmithing, these, uh, these, these stems, they come off and they're numbered and you can fold it because often the quartz would move. Mm -hmm. And so this piece is incredible that it, it actually still exists because as we all know, jewels like this are, are broken down, the stones are used. And at the bottom of each, um, each stem, you have a very stylized flower. You can see the enamel work, beautiful enamel work. And there's even uh, some octahedron or point cut diamonds. They're not cut, this is their natural state. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, there's something like 33, and I even read that some of them are, are actually uh, imitations. So to show you that diamonds were extremely rare, of course all of these stones coming from the east at the time, diamonds only from India, back in, when this was made in the 14th century. And we thought it was a beautiful, um, let's say, uh, trace of this goldsmithing. There's the, the jury is still out on who actually made it. It belonged uh, to Anne of Bohemia, who was the queen who, uh, with Richard II, who was actually deposed by Henry IV. So there's a theory that it could have been made in Prague by a French goldsmith or a French trained goldsmith. And they say this because these little beads, uh, the, the little granules uh, or beads that you see on the edges of those stems, apparently those are something that were typically French. The jury is still out. There's even a theory that it's been made in Venice. What's important is that we can still see it today in the museum in the residence museum. And on the right, we had to pay homage to the Tudor Rose. The Tudor Rose, uh, Henry VII, when he finally put an end to the bloody War of the Roses, which lasted something like 30 years, in 1485, when he, he finally defeats uh, Richard III, the York, Richard III, Lancaster, was Henry, red rose for the Lancasters, white rose for the Yorks. And he, what Henry was very smart and he wanted to put an end to this war. So he marries Elizabeth of York. So this is when the white rose and the red rose were joined into what we call the Tudor rose, which still exists to this day on every official uh, emblem of, of, of Britain. And Gerard, which is a very, um, very, let's say, traditional house that was started in the 18th century and became officially the jewelers of the crown under Victoria in 1843, Garrard, as everybody has heard of, they decided to do a, a modern, let's say a contemporary collection around this Tudor rose because it's such an emblematic flower. And it's very classical in the way that they've used these beautiful pearls and this flower, as you see, uh, centered by a cushion cut, beautiful ruby, white gold and diamonds. Uh, it really is something that all even if you're not British, you would recognize. And I find it interesting that a house would do a contemporary collection around such an ancient symbol. Indeed, indeed. Let's leave um, some, this part of the world and move on to Asia to understand a few flowers. As you noticed, we just picked up a selection of them. We're doing the same for this second chapter. And we wanted really to start with, with the lotus. I mean, 
in Buddhism in particular, the lotus flower is quite recurrent for philosophical, poetic ways, uh, spiritual ways, I should say. Um, the idea that the lotus is just growing up out of the muddy lake or pond, so out of the mud, which is the sort of material world, um, something pure, immaculate, will just get out of it with no, no dirt. And if you look at this illustration of the Buddha, this beautiful sculpture over there from the Guimet Museum, which is the Asian Art Museum of Paris, this sculpture sees the Buddha, the Buddha meditating on a lotus. So he's just on the lotus, over the mud, over the materialistic aspects of the world. He is on the awakening. He is detached from the, the concrete reality of the world and sort of elevated out of it. This sort of symbolic aspect was a highly uh, inspirational element in the iconography for, um, for some of the contemporary jewelers. And we wanted to connect with Van Cleef and Arpel's illustration, which is over there on the right. This is sort of a femme lotus, so it's a woman with a lotus, it's sort of a female Buddhist figure, which has lots of a Far East inspirations because yeah. her headdress is very Thai look in a way, um, having the, the gesture inspired from the sculptures of the Buddha, but also sitting down on these sort of leaves, uh, probably from the lotus, made out of mother of pearl, this sort of purity, immaculate purity, completely inspired by the spiritual symbolism over there. And she holds the beautiful um, pink opal lotus over there, which has the beauty and delicacy of the color and which keeps the idea of the spirituality in sort of the illustration. Now, though we know where we have our, uh, all our friends in Asia today, you all re recognize the puny. It's still the national flower emblem of China. It's a flower, one of the oldest flowers in the terms of being cultivated and used since nine, the ninth century before Common Era. It was cultivated as, as far back as the Tang Dynasty in the 600s in the gar Imperial Gardens. It actually represents opulence. It represents wealth. It represents nobility. And all of us have seen the beauty of a puny as it, it, as it grows and the, f the petals actually change color. It's almost like fireworks. And of course has been inspiring artists for centuries. And on the left we chose this Fami Rose, which was actually means a pink family. It was a technique in porcelain that was developed in the Yongzheng period, so from the 1720s on. And what it was is it's a technique that allows a lower firing temperature which means that you can have a palette, more delicate palette, and you can see rather than bright reds and bright blues, you have this very subtle coloring of the puny, just showing exactly what we just discussed, this, the petals that change colors as the puny opens. And this beautiful innovation, it was actually to uh, probably to uh, please Western taste because this, there was exporting this beautiful porcelain to the West, and this was the period in France, of course, when uh, Hokai was starting, mm -hmm. beautiful colors. And so on the right, we have a piece by a French jeweler named uh, Alexis Fadiz. Fadiz, uh, for those of us, of course, historians we know, Faliz was a name as known as Cartier and other houses at the time. He uh, and his son, Lucien, they became specialists in this beautiful form of cloisonné enamel. They had seen these techniques in the, inter in the exhibitions, uh, 1867 in Paris, 1862 in London, when Japan and, had opened up to the West and shown its works of art. And this enameling technique, which is not only Japanese, it goes far back, far further back, but they were exposed to this idea of, of cloisonné. So this is actually a pendant. And if you look carefully, the punies, just like in the porcelain, they're represented with a different beautiful palette of colors, this uh, great gradation of pink. And as the name indicates, cloisonné enamel is when you create cloison, which are little, um, little reserves in French, the word. And then they put the paste, which has got silica. It's very complicated. It's basically glass, silica, sand. And then they put, a, 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 let's say, a metallic oxide to create those colors. And on the back of this pendant, which I can't show you, it's red, and there's a sort of an ikebana. So again, is it Chinese? Is it Japanese? 
it's not important. This is a period in the 1860s in, um, in France when Asia became all the rage, and they were just blending all of these different. Uh, and just by the way, the, these pieces were, I don't know the exact uh, prices, but they were quite expensive mm -hmm. because it was a very costly process. Mm -hmm. So Falise, of course, no longer exists, unfortunately, but beautiful um, uh, work. Indeed, absolutely. Um, let's move to another flower, which is chrysanthemum. Um, it's easy when you look at um, Asian art in a large way. Flowers are everywhere. We've been talking about um, sculpture. You, you present a porcelain. Now this is an album, flowers and insects that you see on the left. Um, flowers are everywhere. The chrysanthemum is very positive, And we insist on this word because to give in a very quick way the idea, in the West, chrysanthemum of the flowers you will bring to the graveyard for November um, to, to, to cry for those that are deceased. So, Le Toussaint, all saints. Le Toussaint, all saints, yes. It's, it has something related to the one who passed away. Completely not for, for Asia. It will have something related to the beauty of the flower, to something with, with the good waves, we could say, bringing positive elements of your life. And we can see how the details of the illustration which is on this album really give honor to the the beauty of the petals over there to the hues um red pink color to the white over there and even to the movement <clears throat> of the leaves going down and this was a great inspiration for van cleef and Arpels. <clears throat> sorry i'm losing my voice <clears throat> um back again um, here with the, the petals having the same shape, the same movement going down in this way with the beautiful workmanship of Mistress Set, which was patented by Van Cleef and Alpers in 1933. And what is interesting is to see here, they, they worked on the beauty of the leaves, on the, the beauty of the shape itself of the flower, not with a Western eye, but with this idea of the Eastern inspiration. So it's looking in a way through the eye of someone from Asia, looking at the beauty of the flower with the meaning of it in its way. So all positive and typical of the pieces of the late 30s. So we can't avoid talking about orchids. Orchids, which of course, they fascinated the West and they, it's one of the most, actually, it's the second most, I didn't know this, the second most uh, common flowering plant. There's 28,000 uh, different species. And orchids, of course, they grow, they can grow in the air on the side of a tree and you can actually see the roots and they have a certain, yes, seduction. We talked about this in our last uh, lecture on flora with our uh, history, with our swan, love of swan, etc. And But this time we wanted to talk about the, the side of orchids. They represent also virility, virility because these roots, they resemble a certain organ on the male anatomy, which I won't pronounce. And so the ancient Greeks uh, thought it was a, a very, a sort of a plant that would help you with virility and perhaps um, for ladies to have a male child. It's mm -hmm. all these different connotations. In Asia, it's of course, um, it's opulence, it's luxury and seduction. And the orchid, orchids became much more known in the West, let's say in the 19th century when we had these international exhibitions and people started to learn how to hybrid, make hybrids and to cultivate them in greenhouses. And on the left is this, he's a lesser known artist actually, Jugitsu Ikeda. He did a series of paintings for a wealthy gentleman who was one of the uh, original investors for Asahi. And he created, he had a palace, which is now the museum um, for Asahi, the Oyazami Palace, Omazahi. And he actually had a set of orchids and this artist painted them for him in the 30s. And then he made a set of prints, uh, which are depicted here. And on the right is a beautiful, it's actually a hair ornament, believe it or not. Again, we're in Art Nouveau. Uh, Wolfers, who was the sort of primary Art Nouveau uh, jeweler, just like Lalique in France, in fact, most likely influenced. But this piece is actually, it's actually a lady slipper orchid, which we call because of that, the way that cups down. And you'll notice it has all of this enamel, which is completely transparent. So in English, we say, we use a French expression, plique à jour. It's extremely difficult to, to do, especially if you look at the way the leaves are curved. And you also have gems. So Wolfers made a conscious choice to use rubies and a diamond. We know that Art Nouveau artists like Lalique, they tended not to use gems, but 
glass, enamel. It was about the composition, but sometimes Art Nouveau uh, um, jewelers, they had to compromise for their, for their clients mm -hmm. because, who wanted gems. But Wolfer is also is known for his, he was a sculptor of stones. So sometimes you see Wolfer's pieces with beautifully sculpted um, tourmalines, etc. But what's, what we love about this orchid is its size. And it's also got a little bit of a scary side. It almost looks like it's carnivorous, doesn't it? Yeah. Wolfer's is, he's Belgian. Belgian Art Nouveau had a very strong symbolism meant to it. So it's a masterpiece which you can see in the Victoria and Albert Museum. And a lady showing up in a party with this in her hair would quite, create quite a shock. Oh it? yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, we cannot not talk about Sakura. I mean, it's impossible uh, not to consider this really important flower in the Japanese culture. This is really important to see that every year uh, for the arrival of spring, so it's the idea of <clears throat> new life, life coming back, the good days arriving back. This um, illustration, this um, ukiyo-e, this woodblock print by Hiroshige <clears throat> is absolutely important because it gives uh, along the Sumida River this illustration of people walking by the sakura, which pink color is easily recognizable over there. And we all know that it lasts about two weeks, so it's very ephemeral. It, it has a short time to live, and it's, it has a philosophical way to understand. It's like our life. Our life is short, of course, longer than two weeks, but it has an end. So enjoy life. It has the idea of carpe diem, we say in Latin, enjoy the day today, because we don't know how tomorrow will be. So this really has this powerful symbolism of life, um, enjoying of, of life praying and this thing would really inspire a brand of, of, of jewelry in Japan called Sakura diamonds even in the name it has the cherry blossom and the illustration is with the pinkish color the iconography of the cherry blossom but believe it or not the faceting is much higher than the number of facets which you would have normally for a brilliant cut diamond and the position of the faceting would reproduce the shape of a cherry blossom so it's a sakura within a sakura it has this idea of, of diving into the sakura even in miniature and it proves how important is the flower for the Japanese culture just like we're diving into sakuras here, we're Absolutely. surrounded by sakuras. By, by Mika like Nagawa. Part of the tree. We, we have the idea to, to keep this color in a very acid, a strong way, but really into them. We also bamboo, of course, another, um, another flora that's typical for a thousand years in, 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 in art and Japanese and Chinese painting, etc. And bamboo, of course, is resistance. The bamboo, it never breaks, it bends, it's very strong. The fact that bamboo is hollow, it, rep it, it represents modesty. The deep roots are resilience. Mm -hmm. The simple and tall uh, trunk is also a, a nobility. And it represents all of these things, very important um, ideas. And on the left, we have a jade vase, which has every symbol of luck you could possibly want. The bamboo, of course, is lucky. The two phoenix, phoenix is only land when times of peace. And they actually eat the seeds of the bamboo. So you have two phoenixes, one on rocks and one on a lingji, which is a form of mushroom, another uh, lucky symbol. So the, these phoenixes reuniting on a bamboo, it's a very, augurs very good luck and uh, prosperity. And we, we love this. We discovered recently, of course, um, this jeweler, uh, Nakajima, he does a beautiful version of bamboo. And it's sort of a neo Art Nouveau or an Art Nouveau revival, if you will. It's all enamel work. This is opaque enamel in the background, and he has a form of cloisonné. Remember we talked about how the Fadi's family? Mm -hmm. He has his own version of cloisonné, which is based on a, a Japanese technique from, from the Meiji era. And it's the bamboo, of course, not broken, leaning to each side. And you have even, you have berries, which are made in coral. And you even have what looks like, it is transparent enamel on these little leaves, plica uh, jour, we could say. But again, it's his own Japanese technique, which is based on an ancestral tradition. And the berries are actually interesting because when you have the berries, it's imperial bamboo. And it even has this other connotation, uh, very beautifully, very beautifully executed. And it's part of this revival that we're going to talk about a little bit today of the, the importance of fauna, uh, flora, excuse me, in jewelry, which is really come back with a roar, hasn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Since the, 
the late 19th century to the early 20th century, we really consider that flowers would have a very strong power back with probably the context of the industrial revolution. So the industry would transform the cities. People would be looking for more nature, probably. And this is how we try to analyze this today's mythology. And we're not going to start today, today, but we'll start in this late, late 19th century with hydrangea. Um, every single flower could have many meanings. So we try to focus on one or two. And here, gratitude is the one we wanted to, to, to talk about Adrenja. Um, this is something you can definitely see with Berthe Morisot's painting. She was an Impressionist since day one. Since the first exhibition of the Impressionist, 20 years before the painting. Now we are in 1894. What is really nice to see is this flower bouquet in the vase of hydrangea called Hortensia in French uh, with these beautiful ladies related to gratitude over there. It's a, it's a, it's a good illustration in a feminine environment that Berthe Morisot, who was a female painter, really illustrates very well. But if you cross the channel, you get to England by the very same time, it was the late Victorian era and during the reign of Queen Victoria, if a man was giving uh, some hydrangea to a woman. It was absolutely not a favor. It was not something related to gratitude. It was if this woman rejected him. So it was only to say that she was cool hearted, so really to tell you how one flower could have opposite meanings. And next to it, you have a beautiful um, ring, which is a contemporary ring in 2017 by Ilgiz Fazulzianov from Russia. What is interesting in this cocktail ring, it has um, beautiful a beautiful faceted pearl in the center and this sort of hydrangea bush all around with these pastel colors, which are giving back the positive vision of the flower, of the plant, completely sort of an our nouveau revival inspiration over there, which is in an homage, a tribute. He always pays to Lalique and the great enamelers of the Art Nouveau, completely making them with his own taste. So the magnolia, of course, there was a French botanist named Pierre Magnol who gave the magnolia this name in the 17th century. But in China, it's an ancient flower, Ho Pu. I hope I said that right. And the magnolia represents purity, nobility. For ladies in the south of, of my country, the United States, they always have magnolias in their bouquets because it represents purity. Mm -hmm. Of course, a bride is very pure. And it's that whiteness that really, um, I think, that inspires uh, artists to use uh, the magnolia and we have this still life with Magnolia by Matisse. It's a, ma it's a masterpiece from 1941. And Matisse, he would meticulously detailed every aspect. We're showing you a detail only. But he meticulously detailed every, the pitcher, the shell, the shell, the actual vase in the middle, and the this copper cauldron or this copper pot around the magnolia, it's almost like uh, a halo. And so Matisse gives the, he almost gives the magnolia the spiritual side to it. And of course, he was very concerned that the white looked very white on, those, on that flower. And Matisse actually loved this painting. He said it was his favorite work. He said, I put all of my power into it. So the magnolia here, it's, we don't even know what it symbolizes. It could symbolize purity. It could symbolize a, a religious connotation. But in any case, it's the centerpiece of this masterpiece. And we wanted to show you a contemporary, a young a jeweler, uh, born in Hong Kong, working in, in London, Annabella Chan. She's a very interesting personality because she started as an architect and she worked with a major English architect, Moore. And she also uh, studied fashion and she was working in Alexander McQueen, designing embroideries and prints. And she decided to go back to school to the Royal College of Art and she became a jeweler. And what's interesting about Annabella Chan's jewels is she uses recycled aluminum, so basically your can of your soft drink, and she learned a process of cutting it into little squares and she melts it in her own uh, atelier, 600 degrees to make lingots, and then they use, just like they would a precious metal, they, they cast it into these beautiful shapes. And she uses a special technique, uh, PV, uh, PVD I think it's called, uh, which is a way to 
give that patina on the actual aluminum. And what's interesting too is she uses a laboratory grown stone. So what, what looks like a gorgeous, it is a yellow sapphire if you will, but it's laboratory grown. And this idea of the lightness using uh, materials which, which are more modern and which uh, are, let's say, less common, but in a very high jewelry handmade piece. So a very talented um, young, young jeweler and her, her, her boutique in London has become sort of a haven of people interested on, I think it's on Sloan Street. It's been, she doesn't do a lot of advertising. People just talk about her. She has movie stars and celebrities wearing her jewels. So very unusual. We wanted to touch on these younger jewelers. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to make visual connections, as you see, with one, um, let's say, fine art object, exactly. painting mainly, to something which is a more contemporary jewel piece. And this is exactly what we did. There's Georgia O'Keeffe, there's a beautiful retrospective, which is the first exhibition on the artist in Paris at the moment at the Pompidou Center. Um, so we really wanted to pay homage to this monument of American painting, contempor modern contemporary painting. Georgia O'Keeffe depicted this single lily with red, which had this very organic sort of movement in the shape. It has something also you want to, to come closer. You really have a close up of the painting, but it's the natural cut of the painting in itself. And you really have the idea of, of the power of the color, of this very even tactile aspect of it. And this is the same tactile element that inspired Emmanuel Tarpin, uh, who's um, one of the young, figure of the French new generation of the jewelers, of the creators uh, in France, was well, really nice in 2019, two years after he really launched his, uh, his creation, his business, you have with aluminum this idea to replicate the very same movement, smooth delicacy of the petal in a purely white color. Calla Lily was really related to purity and faith. It has sort of spiritual connection, Very which you really saw. So, well. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You really saw with Georgia O'Keeffe painting, in which Emmanuel Tarpin here embodies in a great way. We also wanted to talk about the Genko again for our Asian friends. You all recognize the Genko. It is rumored to live for a thousand years. I've never tested it, but it's probably true. And in fact, uh, the blast after the blast of Hiroshima, there were Genkos, four Genkos that survived. Not to bring up a, 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 a tragic incident, but just to say the Genko is really longevity. And actually, we wanted to talk about the Lalanne, of course, Claude Lalanne. They were Les Lalanne, of course, François Xavier and Claude. They were really um, sort of multi-talented, but on the edge of decorative arts and fine arts. They loved animals. But Claude, she loved nature. And she would actually sometimes even take leaves, uh, natural leaves, and she would electroplate them in uh, copper sulf uh, copper, copper sulfate, excuse me, we think. Uh, she never really revealed her, her methods, but she would, if you can, you can see on this ginkgo bench, there, this fan shape of the ginkgo leaf, which has been such an inspiration in Japanese lacquer and in Chinese art for, for millennia. And you have this bench, which actually the leaves become the, those which are supporting the people, uh, the, the people sitting on it. So I find it very poetic that the ginkgo, which is so resistant, is going to actually uh, hold us up. And we, we selected these, um, these ginkgos. They're frozen ginkgos. They're, they're by frosted, excuse me, ginkgos uh, by Michelle Ong, another great jeweler. From, she's actually in Hong Kong, lived part of her life in Canada, and came back and started her, her business of carnet. Uh, which means sketchbook. And you can see what's beautiful about these, the design is, is superb, but the use of these diamonds, which are transparent. It's not the traditional way that a brilliant cut diamond. It's almost like a mogul diamond, the diamonds you see in that mogul jewelry, where they keep that transparency and just cut the edges. And so this idea of the frost is so poetically depicted in, uh, in, in Michelle Ong's uh, creation of Genkos. We really wanted to find some unusual plants that you would not see commonly in the books of flowers. Uh, banana flowers, I think, is part of them. It's quite uncommon. And they, in Asia, in Africa, in many places of the world, South America, will be related to fertility, to abundance in a large way. And putting these two illustrations was a it was a crush for us to really put them together. Yves Claire is a contemporary French artist, uh, and this sort of huge headdress with the banana tree flowers was uh, impossible to resist. And putting next to it 
these beautiful earrings with banana flowers in wood by Silvia Formanovic, who's from Brazil, who uses mostly materials from her country. And what is really nice here is this very unusual use of the plant over there to really have something of a Brazilian twist, we could say, but bringing it with this new symbolism of the banana flower, something positive, something good in a way, and something a bit original. And we also wanted to talk about the poppy. Of course, in ancient Greece, we see on, on different iconography, the poppy represents sleep and dreams, also a peaceful way to go to the next life. But we wanted to focus on remembrance today. And you all probably recognize the poppy in the middle. It's for the British, uh, the British Legion's poppy campaign, remembering the, the, the people fallen during World War I. And what's interesting is we found out doing preparing this, it was a French lady who was at the, the basis of this, Madame Guérin. She was a school teacher, and she, she actually started this idea of the poppies to raise funds for the families of, of soldiers, and uh, etc. So she actually uh, convinced the British to start this idea idea and she actually made the first poppies for them and they were in such demand that in Britain they had to start creating them and they I think the first time they made eight million they sold out so of course now when we see this poppy we all remember and on the right we wanted to pay homage to Mika because as you see she loves bright colors and bright flowers and in this this poppy you almost feel like you're she even I think she even talks about almost like an insect mm -hmm. the view of the insect that's going to land on the flower, and we have a very opulent uh, jewel on the left by Jar. I think Jar needs no um, introduction, just around the corner on the Place Vendôme. American jeweler, very mysterious, only 70 pieces per year, but he actually, this beautiful uh, lapidary, this lapidary work on the tourmaline um, poppies, and the winding uh, stem around a 38 carat uh, diamond in the middle, and again ending in this other, this poppy. It's almost as if it's, um, it looks like it's alive and it's moving. It's very unusual um, a piece, and we wanted to just pay homage since a neighbor right around the corner and a beautiful way of depicting a poppy. So you see, we could have spent more hours and hours to talk about the world of flowers and the secret language behind them. Flowers, plant, leaves, as you can read, they are part of nature, which is an endless source of inspiration. So how may we conclude? Well, we wanted, as a sort of conclusion slide, to really have some very, very uncommon plants or very unusual meanings of them. And we'll start with the one in the centre, which is from Victoire de Castellan, who worked for Dior Jewelry. Um, it's called Granny Opalia Devorus. So it really sees that the prongs of the setting of the black opal right in the centre so are teeth like a jaw devouring, like devorous the name, devouring, eating the stone. And it has a sort of carnivorous flower inspiration in this collection that was really dedicated to the idea that um, the, the, the lady wearing it wouldn't be just a pretty flower, but would be someone with a strong character. And on the left, we wanted we, we were so impressed with these earrings by Hemmerle, of course, fourth generation jewelers uh, from, from Munich. And they're, they're so innovative in the way that they represent nature. And we have these Japanese lanterns, which is actually a fruit. And it's very, very interesting the way they depict the leaves, which protect actually physalis. It actually, one of the symbols of physalis is protection. And they've used white gold, which they've patinated in a secret way, of course, with beautiful mellow pearls. Mellow, if you went to the, well, those of you in Asia, I'm not sure you saw it, but we had beautiful mellow pearls. Mellow, mellow, they're these beautiful pink pearls, orangey pearls from um, a gastropod from the, the Philippine Sea. And it's just, uh, we, we're trying to get back to nature uh, between stylization, between naturalism, and we found these pieces extremely naturalistic and poetic at the same time. Absolutely. And last but not least, we wanted to end with this very original tree by Van Cleef in 2008. It was a collection dedicated to the gardens in a large way, gardens of the world. It's called Rêverie, so it's like a dream, um, but a dream of a love story. What I really like is what is not visible in here, which is with this beautiful super colored tree, you would have the, the, the swing, the which swing. is there, and a couple is missing, or a couple to become is missing. Two person normally, one pushing the other on the swing. So you really have this idea of the, of the love story which is there. It's always under the tree, in the secret garden that lovers will, uh, will meet. Uh, since the ancient mythological 
episodes to the, we could say, literature of the Middle Ages, courtly life. It's in the forest, protected by the tree that you would have these love stories. And I think this is part of it. The messages are related to what the flowers would be um, given as a strong symbolism by the people. And I think that's the, the conclusion we can give. Flower inspiration and flower symbolism is very cultural. Each culture could position one or two meanings, but from one place to the other, from one period to the other, you would have lots of cultures and lots of interpretation. That's part of the, the great, great things we know about it. So it was a pleasure to have you today for this talk. Stay with us for more information. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the talk today. If you love flowers, remember there is the exhibition which is open until mid-November in here. Um, if you can't uh, go there, no worries. We have another talk next month. We'll be completely dedicated to the world of flowers. Uh, Paul will be in duo with the garden specialist, Pascal Garbe, to talk about the four seasons of the Dewey Garden to really help us to analyse flowers in between very naturalistic inspiration to stylization. And uh, now it's the time for you to ask us questions. Maybe you already did. Yes. yes. Have, oh, thank you so much. Questions. Thank you, Aina Zita, for, for sending us all the questions. Let's pick up a few and answer as we can. How about, please tell us about the technique used by Emmanuel Tarpin on his calla lily earrings. And can you tell us more about the calla lily and the symbolism it involves? Well, we don't know exactly the, te you know, jewelers are very, um, they don't tell you exactly everything that they do. It's his secret. But I know, we know that he, he has a specific way that he uh, puts that white patina and the actual, they're textured, apparently. He loves the idea of the, the tactile nature of the jewel. So I can't, we can't tell you exactly how he does it. I think there's some mystery uh, with artists. They like to keep a little bit of secret. But I know the pistol is, uh, is yellow diamonds on yellow gold. And the calla lily, it's a little, I know we've had a lot of discussion about the calla lily. It's, it isn't necessarily, I wish Pascal were here, but next mm -hmm. time he, because he's a great specialist. But the calla lily is, if I understand correctly, it's not actually in the lily family, uh, technically speaking, but it's known as a calla lily through, uh, through the ages. And the word calla from, is from the Greek, which means purity. Mm -hmm. So it's often, um, it's used to represent uh, not all, the Virgin Mary and Christianity and many other, uh, you see it in paintings, uh, even representing Christ. Mm -hmm. So. It's a flower, it can also be called the arum, if I understand. Absolutely. And uh, Emmanuel actually really appreciates the, the unusual shape and the, the ability to show the sensual nature of flowers. And so, yes, it's, it's a very popular, um, let's say, symbolism. Um, the Gar archives were privately acquired some years ago. Are they available now? That's a good question. I don't know. I know Gar is a very old, yes. old um, jewelry house in the UK, official supplier of the crown. So I hope they are. That would be great to know. But thank you for the, for the elements. Uh, we actually don't know, but that would be great if they are, indeed. I think there's a question about the Flora exhibition. You mentioned the introduction. Yes, if you want to... That's an easy one. Yeah, okay, that's the, so, that's, that's the one for you. This exhibition is open from noon to 8 p.m. every day but Tuesday. It's, you just have to register online to get a, a time for the reasons of the, the health reasons right now. And, and, the, and it's actually going on uh, only closed on Tuesdays. So please come, uh, just reserve online on the Von Cleff and Arpel site. And it's, it's really, really incredibly um, inspiring as, a, as, a, as an exhibition, I can tell you. Can you tell us more about chrysanthemums east versus west? Um, yes, of course. It is interesting how I think for this particular uh, plant, this is one of the rare flower where the meaning is so opposite, so opposite. In the West, I mean, I'm French, so I will tell you the, uh, the at first what I know well, it is really something that you will find for the All Saints for late October, early November, on the 1st of November, people will go uh, in France to the graveyards uh, with bouquet of chrysanthemum, most of the of the garden boutique, of the flower boutique, would just um, sell, sell them at precisely at the time so the people could go to the grave uh, to the, the people from the family or friends who passed away and put them at this very moment. It has this idea of a flower which 
last a bit longer in this very hard season, right? So it has the idea of a certain resistance. And I think this is probably why it's related to the word of, of the dead for the West. For the East, this aspect of resistance was given in a very positive way, in a very um, life living way, I would say, uh, as it becomes something that people will, will consider a symbol of beauty, a symbol of resistance also, and a sort of lasting flower in other ways. I think there are many, many interpretations depending also on the different countries in the East because it's, exactly. a, it's a huge continent. So the interpretation you will have in Japan versus China versus Korea could be similar, but sometimes with more, more, more aspects to it. And this is probably what is probably interesting on the language of flowers. It is because each country or culture gives its own meaning to it. Actually, somebody just added something about, the, yes, in America, the chrysanthemum, it's associated with autumn. And we do, yes, we, we use that orange color we love the, for decorate our tables, for Thanksgiving, what, what, probably the most important uh, holiday, uh, ecumenical. So yes, I agree. Somebody said, mentioned football. Yes, there are connotations with autumn, our school dances, mm. football games. And there's actually a question about the language of flowers, uh, Charlotte de la Tour. I think Anadita probably has the link, or have she, has, she, have she, has she not sent it to you yet? She, she will. It's, um, you can find these books on the French uh, National Library site. It's called Gallica. And there's many. If, actually, if you just tap language of flowers on, on a, a search engine, you'll get a lot of, there's a lot of different ones, of course. We only mentioned Charlotte de la Tour. There's Hammer Pirgstahl, who is also a French writer. And they're actually quite amusing. And they probably most likely have been translated, because I know, I when, so. as, I, as we said earlier, they revived the, public, the, the publishing industry at the time because they were so popular. So I think it's quite easy to find information mm -hmm. on those. I think now we're leaving you. If you have any more question, do not hesitate to contact us via the address contact at L'Ecole or the social media of L'Ecole, Instagram, Facebook. Um, this uh, conversation, as all the talks, has been recorded and will be on the YouTube channel of L'Ecole. So you will find us again if you, if you need. And to go further on this particular topic, you will receive by tomorrow an email with some links that you mentioned, including Charlotte de la, de la Tour, uh, um, Language of yes. Flowers book, and also a bibliography if you really want to, to dive into the word of flowers. It was a pleasure to be with you today once again, and we're looking forward to having you for the next talk very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone.